Coming up in primetime lawmakers, a glimpse at how state charter schools will be funded as legislation gets a hearing before the House Education Committee. House leadership says the hearing is intended to set legislators' minds at ease before the constitutional amendment comes up for a vote in the House tomorrow. Want to be a nurse or a barber? You need a license from the Secretary of State. Under legislation heard in Senate Committee today, big changes could be coming in the way professional licenses are handled. The Senate Appropriations Committee passes the FY 2012 supplemental budget. The newest version of the bill includes $40 million in reduced spending. And parents and B-average students in Georgia have been depending on the Hope Scholarship for a free college education for almost two decades. Funding problems and recent changes mean that college costs a little more these days. Tonight, I'll be joined on set by Senator Buddy Carter, chairman of the Senate Higher Education Committee, and Senator Jason Carter, co-sponsor of several HOPE-related bills. If you've got kids going to college in Georgia, stay tuned for this. For Tuesday, February 21st, 2012, the 22nd legislative day of the Georgia General Assembly, this is Primetime Lawmakers. Good evening and welcome to Primetime Lawmakers, GPB's nightly coverage of the Georgia General Assembly. I'm Scott Slade. Let's go live to the Capitol now, where Sandra Parrish reports there's movement of the charter schools front. Good evening, Sandra. Good evening, Scott. The House Rules Committee has put the constitutional amendment back on the floor tomorrow for another vote. It will include an amendment supported by the Democratic Caucus that specifies any charter school approved by the state will be given the name of state charter school and makes it clear that only state money will be used to fund it. Speaker Pro Tem Jan Jones says there are still kinks that need to be worked out of the enabling legislation, but made it clear to committee members that local funds would not be diminished. These students would be funded through a, um, a 20th program of QBE, so it would not fluctuate depending on where a student lives. If a student uh, comes from the city of Decatur, and another student comes from Pike County, the funding will be the same. The only difference would be on the characteristics that that student might have, like special needs or, or gifted. The sum would be the average uh, of the lowest 3% of school systems as ranked by through the equalization formula. But local school systems are still concerned. Even though it's the poorest three school districts, that's still, they're calculating a local revenue to add to the state, and that would be the amount that would be in that 20th program of QBE. So it, it will be a, a significantly higher level of state funding than goes to school systems for other programs. I, I think it's fair to say that the superintendents were concerned about losing local funds, but, but we also recognize that there's just one, one state budget, there's just one pie. And if this carves out more of the state money for a particular use, then that's less money that's available for other things in the state budget. So it's still, the funding is still an issue. It's not the same as local funding, but it's still an issue. I spoke with one Democratic representative who opposed the measure last time, who tells me she plans to support it tomorrow. I also ask a Republican who voted against it before who says he's still on the fence. The House passes a bill to allow pubs that brew their own beer to increase the amount they, they sell to distributors. Representative Richard Smith says it will help improve the bottom line for brew pubs around Georgia. Basically all it does is allow a brew pub to increase the barrels of, of beer that it uh, produces from 5,000 to 10,000. And out of this 10,000 they can sell at least up to 5,000 uh, to a licensed distributor. Also, the barrels that they sell to a licensed distributor will not factor in against their um, formula for uh, food and alcohol drinks. The bill passed 152 to 6 and now goes to the Senate. Concern over proposed cell phone towers at nine DeKalb County schools brought parents to the Capitol today in support of a bill to prohibit any more towers from going up on school property in DeKalb. The FCC regulates exposure and you cannot ban cell phone towers based upon exposure, okay? That's why my legislation specifically bans them on placement placement to schools. As local legislation, the bill by Representative Carla Drenner would only affect DeKalb County, but she may propose a statewide ban as well. It was mostly parents who spoke in favor of it. I don't advocate putting my child or any other child's 
life at risk for the sake of wireless cell phone connectivity. Um, my question has been for a while, why the schools? Why the schools? It's, it's like the, the industry is taking advantage of the fact that certain schools need money. A representative with the wireless industry spoke against it. The FCC places extreme limits on the amount of radiation that a wireless facility can emit. And if you were going to consider banning a wireless <coughs> device, you should lump in folks microwaves, police banner, uh, police scanners, baby monitors. There are any number of things, wireless routers. There's a reason that there's warnings on microwave ovens in, in your home. You don't stand next to the microwave for eight hours a day for 180 days a year. You don't do that. Representative Drenner says while her bill would not affect those cell phone towers currently under contract, another bill being drafted in the Senate could possibly affect the zoning of them. A new ethics reform bill was introduced in the House today by Representative Tommy Smith. You may remember he was the lone Republican signer on ethics legislation in the House earlier this session. This new plan would change the amount a lobbyist could spend on a lawmaker from $100 an event to $100 per day. It does increase the spending amount for out-of-town trips from $500 to $2,000. Smith says he now has five Republicans and five Democrats who have signed on to his bill. Scott. All right, thank you very much, Sandra. If your driving record isn't one to brag about, you might want to pay close attention to a new bill that passed the House Public Safety and Homeland Security Committee today with only one opposing vote. Drivers should know that it could soon be a felony to elude a police officer if you're about to be pulled over, typically resulting in a police chase. We all know the signs of law enforcement. Any hand motion, spoken authority, sirens, or emergency lights are all signs that you should pull over. In order to save yourself from two new counts, don't run from the police. Not only would the crime result in a felony, but the eluding driver would also have to forfeit their car to law enforcement. This new bill would not apply to young adults under 17. The new rules would uh, up the standards of current laws by moving it from a misdemeanor to a felony in an effort to save lives on the road. The bill now moves on to the House Rules Committee. The House Game, Fish and Parks Committee submitted a due pass recommendation on a bill that would authorize special hunting privileges to those suffering from a terminal illness. The bill is named after Taylor Gramling, an 18-year-old Georgian who succumbed to leukemia last September. One of his last dying wishes was to go deer hunting. The proposed legislation would allow people under the age of 21 who are suffering from terminal illness to receive special hunting privileges provided they are under supervision and abide by state hunting regulations. The bill, having already passed in the Senate, now moves to House rules. The House Game Fisher Parks Committee also took action on a bill sponsored by Representative Debbie Buckner uh, regarding Georgia's parks. The bill would mandate local governments to notify the state prior to a closure of a local park. A substitute to the bill also added that if a park has more than 50% of its hours cut, the state must be notified. The committee recommended due pass by substitute, and the bill now moves on to House rules. Now back to the Capitol again, where Kiosha Howard has the details on a measure, a big one that seeks to consolidate the state's licensing boards. Kiosha. Scott, thousands, even hundreds of thousands of Georgians could be affected by this bill. Literally every profession that requires employees to be licensed by the state, that includes nurses, accountants, architects, the list goes on. The bill would create a seven-member consumer board that would make licensing decisions. Currently, there are 43 boards, one for each profession. Secretary of State Brian Kemp and Senator Bill Hamrick presented the legislation today to the Senate Regulated Industries Committee. Secretary Brian Kemp says that licensing process in the state will be more effect efficient with one board. When I ran for office, I ran because I wanted to streamline government, make it more efficient and more accountable to the people, and make government do more with less. I believe that, I believe this legislation does that. Several organizations whose members are required to be licensed by the state showed up in opposition to the measure. The most common complaint was that a seven-member board made up of consumers would not have the professional knowledge to make a decision that affects professional organizations. The Georgia Nurses Association opposes the authority shift in Senate Bill 445 because licensure, revocation, discipline matters, and complaints are best regulated by those who are professionally educated to interpret the complexities of health care. A great deal of authority under this new legislation will be placed in this newly created seven-member consumer board. We do not believe those members will possess the necessary profession-based knowledge. How are some of these consumers going to decide if the eye drops that went into the eyes were contraindicated for glaucoma or not? If we have another 
Hyatt incident where 1,500 or 2,000 people are killed and it collapses, how is a consumer going to determine whether or not it was an architectural defect, a mechanical defect, an engineering, a structural? I can go on and on and on ad nauseum. You must have professionals setting in judgment of other professionals. You just heard from Debbie Hatmaker and Aubrey Valinez. The bill does include a provision that says that the current 43 boards will remain intact. The organi organizations present today say that provision is not sufficient as the bill does not require that the consumer board consult the professional boards before making a decision. The committee did not vote today. Secretary Brian Kemp plans to make some changes to the bill to ease the organization's concerns. And also under the Gold Dome today, the Senate Appropriations Committee passed the fiscal year 2012 budget. The governor called for a $47 million reduction in spending. Senate Appropriations Chair Jack Hill explains how the committee worked it out. Governor reduced the revenue estimate by $47 million. And for right now, we've basically made an accounting change to, uh, to delay a, C a care management organization payment uh, into the following year. And again, that was Senator Jack Hill. Other than the governor's call for that reduction, Senator Hill tells me that there was no change in the amount of spending. The Senate did, however, make a change to appropriate some Department of Transportation funds toward future road projects. We did change one, one item from the, from the House version. The Senate altered part of that $900 million, some $25 million of it, and created a new program for economic development infrastructure. In other words, these would be roads the that would uh, accompany a new economic development project, those kinds of things that would, uh, that would help uh, a community in its economic development efforts. Scott Senator Hill tells me that he does not expect much back and forth between the House and Senate over the supplemental budget. It's pretty flat this year, so I think we'll see this one move through rather quickly. Okay, well, there's not a lot of money. You don't have as many fights. Thank you very much, Kiosha. If Social Security is, it can be called the third rail of national politics, the Hope Scholarship can be called the third rail of Georgia politics. The wildly successful program has affected higher education in a way that nothing else could in our state. Changes to the program are not greeted with enthusiasm, but in recent years, decreased lottery revenues and increases in numbers of students have put the program in some danger. Some even say danger of bankruptcy. It's a victim of its own success. From September of 1993 to January 2012, $5.3 billion in scholarships and grants have been awarded with the HOPE program, helping more than 1.4 million students. Joining me now to talk about the HOPE scholarships and grants are Senator Buddy Carter, Chair of the Higher Education Committee, and Senator Jason Carter. He's sponsor of several HOPE-related measures. Thank you both for being with us tonight. And if I say Senator Carter, we're going to have a problem <laughs> all night long. So, we'll, we'll, well, I'll call you by your first and last name throughout the evening. That's okay. Please, okay. you can call me Jason. Okay. <laughs> Senator Buddy Carter, let's start with you. I, don't, I want to get Senator Jason Carter's take as well. What kind of danger is the Hope Scholarship in? We had the word bankruptcy in our, in our description here. Is it really in, in that much peril? Well, I, I don't think it's to the point of bankruptcy. And, and it's important to note that in his first year in office, Governor Dayton Deal faced this dilemma straightforward and and actually and when we passed enduring hope last year we passed some measures that have not had an opportunity to take effect yet and as soon as we can see how those measures the f impact that they have on the hope scholarship then we'll be able to make better decisions as to exactly what we want what we need to do to make sure that hope is sustainable into the future and we're going to do that we will make the adjustments that we need to make and one of those big me big measures is the patch as we call it 90 percent it is. For most it is. Students. We created the Zell Miller Scholars, which was for those students who have a 3.7 and score a 1,200 or above on their SAT. They get 100%. They still do as they have in the past. And then we made those from 3.0 to 3.7. They get 90% of what the college tuition is at this point. And, you know, I mean, let's face it, the reality is 90% is still a good deal. Senator Jason Carter, what do you think? How much peril is the hope in? Well, I, I think that, first of all, it, it's far more dire, I think, than my colleague would, would, would say. Number one, we know today that no one is getting, of the HOPE scholars, is really getting 90% of tuition. The 90% number was from several years ago. In addition, it's essentially vanishing, and it will get worse every single year. The governor's own estimates show that by 2016, it will pay for less than, less than half the cost of college. And in 2020, they'll be paying almost as much as they would pay for full price now. So that, that's not a deal, in my view. And, and these are 
people who earn the HOPE scholarship who are going to be left out in the cold, and middle class people who won't be able to afford college under the current plan. We feel like we ought not wait. All right, so 2016, do you buy that number, Senator uh, Buddy Carter? 2016, well, uh, only half? Well, of course, by if you believe the numbers that are being presented, then 2016 is of concern. But again, we haven't seen the full impact of the legislation that was passed last year. Until we see the impact that that legislation has, we don't know for certain whether those numbers are accurate or not. All right, let's talk about the Zell Miller Scholarship versus the Hope Scholarship before we get further into the weeds on the numbers. I think we have a full screen there to show you the difference. And the Zell Miller Scholarship is designed to uh, award some of the state's brightest scholars to uh, stem the brain drain uh, from, from Hope. The Zell Miller Scholars get 100% tuition. 14% of Hope recipients are eligible. And currently, there are 11,600 Zell Miller recipients. This has been a bone of contention. Senator Jason Carter, do you think the Zell Miller Scholarship discriminates against rural kids and minorities? Well, I, I, I know, according to the Georgia Student Finance Commission and the Board of Regents, that this scholarship program takes money from the middle class and gives it to the, the wealthiest parts of our state. We know that equal populations in South Georgia will not get even close. Sometimes they get 10 times more money in Cherokee County, for example, than they would in Southeast Georgia. That's not about the best and the brightest. It has to be about you know hardworking kids in every community of the state need to be able to go out and succeed and be rewarded. And this rewards wealth, in my view, instead of hard work. But the Zell Miller Scholarship does include valedictorians and salutatorians from each high school, right? It, it does. The, the numbers that we have uh, been given by the Student Finance Commission show that an equal population in Southeast Georgia will get about $700,000 in scholarship money. And an equal population in Cherokee County will get almost $7 million. There's no way to say that there's 10 times more hardworking, deserving kids in Cherokee County than there are in Toombs County. I don't believe that. I don't think anybody believes that. So something's wrong with the Zell Miller program. And our program would give that scholarship to the top 3% of students from every high school, the best and brightest from every community, regardless of income. And we think that's a better plan. How about it, Senator Buddy Carter? You think the Zell Miller scholarship discriminates? And what do you think about that 3% plan? Well, unfortunately, I, I really don't think that, that Senator Carter and, and his party want to go there. I mean, when you when you talk about the lottery revenues, no one's forced to buy a lottery ticket. You're not forced to do that. And if you want to keep a scorecard, when you talk about taxes, I mean, if you look at, you want to talk about something that is disproportionate, the amount of taxes that are being collected from some of these areas and the amount of money that's going back to them, that's disproportionate. And that's something, that I, I, an area I don't really think you want to go to. When we look at the best and the brightest, why should someone be penalized just because of what their parents make? The Hope Scholarship is not awarded based on where you live in the state of Georgia. The Hope Scholarship is not awarded based on the color of your skin. The Hope Scholarship is not awarded based on how much your parents make. The Hope Scholarship is awarded the old fashioned way. You earn it. And that's the way we, we, we really benefit by keeping those people in the state. Would enforcing something other than merit wind up being discriminatory as well? Well, I, I just don't believe that, the, that there are more people in Cherokee County who earn it than there are in Toombs County. You've got hardworking, good students. And if you want to judge merit based solely on an SAT score, that, that's one way to do it. And there's no doubt that that does, that, that, that who your parents are and where you live does have a role because of the numbers I just described about how, how uh, what happens in rural Georgia. But the bigger question in my mind is, are we going to have enough middle class students who can afford to go to college to have the educated workforce and, and technical school to have the kind of educated workforce that we need in order to compete and move forward? If we want to have a strong economy and a prosperous state, we have to ensure that we have the maximum number of kids that can afford college. And, and that's what our plan does. We're talking about skills ready workers going into the workforce. Absolutely. It's been a, uh, a priority of the governor and hope grants yeah. eliminating the minimum GPA requirement for maintaining eligibility. Senator Buddy Carter, you see that going anywhere? Well, the, the HOPE grant has been changed. We changed it last year mm -hmm. to where you have to have a 3.0 as opposed to a 2.0. And, and that's certainly something that we haven't had the chance to see how the impact is going to be and how, how it's going to help us in the HOPE scholarship. Again, the HOPE scholarship to keep the best and the brightest in our state. Those are the ones who are going to, you know, we've, we've worked hard through K through 12 to educate them and to make sure they've done well and they have done well. We don't want them to leave the state. We want them to stay in our universities here. We want them to stay and be 
become the, the lawyers, the pharmacists, the journalists, the, those people in, in our society who are going to carry us to be the legislators of the future. We want them to stay in our state, and that's why we want to reward them for the hard work that they've done. All right, where do you see this going, uh, Senator Jason Carter? Well, I, I hope that, that what we will do is we will focus on the real question, which is ensuring that we have a strong economy, a prosperous Georgia, and the bottom line is the current trajectory for the middle class is terrible. We've seen enough. The governor's own numbers demonstrate that, as, as we've said before, you'll have more people every year who can't afford to go to college. That's not good for our state, and, and I believe that, that there's a lot of support among my colleagues in the Senate and, 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 and Senator Carter's colleagues in the Senate to make a real change and to face these facts, and I, I think we'll be able to do that. If it comes up, we'll need to have you both back to talk about the potential for, a, for an income cap, a means test. We're out of time tonight, but thanks so much for bringing us up Thank to you. speed and where things stand. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. Thanks for your service. Absolutely. We're going to take a short break on primetime lawmakers, but don't go anywhere. There's much more to come. We bring in two more of our stable of capital journalists. When we come back, I'll be joined by Walter Jones of the Morris News Service and Christina Torres of the AJC, two of the best. They'll put things into perspective for you, so stay tuned. Welcome back to Primetime Lawmakers. Time for our reporter roundtable. As part of the show, we tap our stable to the best political journalist in the state. Tonight, I'm joined by Walter Jones, Bureau Chief for Morris News Service, and Christina Torres, a journalist with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, specializing in education and legislative issues. Let's begin at what we just heard, a very eloquent uh, discussion on the, both sides of the Hope Scholarship issue. Christina? Well, obviously, there's passion on both sides, and I don't, you know, this is a debate, I think, that will be going on for years. Um, you know, there are certain things we know, how much income the lottery brings in, around $850 million, uh, annually. And there's a growing pool of students who probably will qualify. I think they project 3 or 4% a year. And mm -hmm. the lottery funding itself is not growing. So you have greater demand as, as sort of a as stationary uh, pool of money. That is going to be a concern. I think it may be a concern sooner rather than later. Uh, earlier this year, lawmakers got projections that showed, I think, starting even in uh, 2013's awards will start dropping again. Hmm. Walter. Well, it, it, it comes down to kind of a fundamental discussion of what the hope is supposed to do. And the Democrats are saying it should be uh, the salvation for the middle class, and the Republicans are saying it should be kind of a reward for the the best and brightest students. It has uh, traditionally, you know, historically, it's kind of fit both roles. Mm -hmm. But with limited resources, you got to pick one horse and go with that. Yeah, it is. But more and more, and that we actually have our first generation now. We've gone a whole generation now in Georgia, more than 20 years, when you get right down to it, right. where people are used to getting a ride for well, college. Know. And now I'm hearing, actually, a professor at Georgia State University told me half his class failed his first exam, and he couldn't figure out why. You know why? They couldn't afford the book. <laughs> Golly. Like, like, in Georgia State. So uh, maybe it's unreasonable to think that uh, people would save a little money before college, but that might be the new paradigm here. Well, well they didn't they used to. Be. It's funny that, um, I mean, people used to do that, but you, you look at uh, Athens, and those kids are driving nice new cars, and they're living in nice uh, condo apartments because mom and dad didn't have to spend the money on tuition. But yeah. the interesting th thing there, though, is if we look at Georgia State and compare it to some place like the University of Georgia, they serve different student populations. Yes. At, yes. at Georgia State, there are a lot more kids who are likely to be the first in their family to go to college. It, there's a difference. Yeah, there is. Let's move on to the charter schools uh, amendment, the state charter schools debate. Uh, the, the House could vote on it virtually any time, the amendment themselves. There's a couple of things in play here, not just the amendment itself, which would require a constitutional majority, but the enabling right. legislation. Speak to that a little bit here and what's going on on that. Well, the enabling legislation is it's a regular bill, which would need uh, the votes, majority votes in both chambers, and then if they pass it, it would go to the governor for a signature. But you have the constitutional amendment which needs two-thirds votes in both chambers. Governor doesn't have to sign it. They don't need his signature. It would go to voters for an up or down vote. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, there's been some movement. Uh, Jan Jones uh, from the House has tried to, to amend it to be more palatable, especially to Democrats, among others. Uh, I think there's momentum in which it could come up uh, as soon as tomorrow for a vote. I think they're trying to push it, strike while the iron's hot, so to mm -hmm. speak. Um, 
you know, the question is, have they swung enough votes? Yeah, There's what do you think? There's a huge amount of leadership uh, interest in, in making this happen. Of course, Jan Jones is the speaker pro tem. It's pretty high on the pecking order anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the Senate leadership is just as eager to make this happen. And so I, th I think they're going to continue to bargain as long as they have to. And they even had a committee meeting today to make lawmakers comfortable with what could happen if the uh, constitutional amendment passes, in other words, how it worked. That's the enabling right. legislation. Well, the issue, right? okay. as we heard, was it's the funding issue. It's right. how is it going to, even unintentionally. Another thing that came up that's uh, almost staggering, uh, uh, we've heard some lawmakers commenting, uh, we don't see 800 pound, 800 pound, 800 page Pages. bills very often. That's this revamping the professional licensure structure in the Secretary of State's office is getting some attention. It is. You know, it's funny. I walked into a, a Senate office today, and, and they're selling. You can get a copy, a digital copy of that bill for $5. And that, that's how big it is. Um, you know, I don't know uh, where it's going to go, how far it's going to go. Uh, I think it, there's well intentioned uh, behind it. Uh, I think some lawmakers were taken aback to what he's trying to do so quickly. This is Brian Kemp, our Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not sure how the governor feels about it, and that would obviously be a big thing, too. Walter, you've been writing about judicial reform potentially moving forward. And would that perhaps happen first with revamping the, ju uh, the juvenile code? Well, yeah, there, there are two bills, one with the juvenile code, and that has been in the works for about four or five years. Uh, a committee of the state bar has been working on that. And that's finally ready to start moving. And um, the other is the governor's bill, which would uh, not, it's for adults, and it has to do with alternative sentencing, basically, for people who are uh, com commit crimes while under the influence of drugs or mm -hmm. mental illness or alcohol. Which is even bigger when you get right down and, to it, And I the suppose. governor wants that. And so. finally, uh, reproductive rights. While they argue over uh, abortion issues, some Democrats have come up to say that, well, you know what, men, we ought to restrict vasectomies too. Well, as the woman on this panel, I think I can get the joke, certainly. And, and I think it was it was a joke, but it was one that was well-intentioned. Uh, there are several abortion bills uh, being considered right now at the Capitol, including a couple in the Senate, uh, the one in the House, uh, talking about uh, when um, a fetus feels pain, I think it's the 20-week. 20, mm, 20 weeks, uh, right. Um, there seems to be some momentum. My colleague uh, Chris Quinn has said he thinks that it's gaining some momentum, that bill. And, and you have this proposal coming out to sort of point out uh, from a female standpoint that, mm -hmm. you know, gosh, what are we thinking about? Right. Well, we'll see. It could even have a bill number pretty quickly. So yeah. thanks so much for joining us both. Get Thank you back you. soon, okay? Coming up tomorrow on Lawmakers, the constitutional amendment to allow state charter schools is expected on the House floor. and We'll be talking about Georgia's pre-K program with Bobby Cagle, Commissioner of the Department of Early Care and Learning, plus all the latest news from under the Gold Dome. Tomorrow on Primetime Lawmakers at 7. If you missed any part of this broadcast, catch the repeat tomorrow morning at 5.30 right here. Coming up next on GPB, American Experience. Tonight's episode, a soundtrack for a revolution. American Experience is next right here on GPB. And that's our broadcast for this 22nd legislative day of the 2012 session. I'm Scott Slade. Join us tomorrow night at 7 right here for Primetime Lawmakers. Happy Mardi Gras. Have a good night. This is a GPB original production.